So, uh, Remo. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, of course, we are doing a lot with vestibular testing, but one of the main key features of diagnosing is still the history. And what we traditionally learn at medical school, first listen to the patient, of course, and let them talk. But the problem with vestibular patients, maybe it's cultural, but in the Netherlands, it is that if you let them talk, they often don't end up. So you have a lot of patients waiting because they're still talking about a problem. So what we always try is to make some kind of structure in the history taking that may guide the patients actually through his history without them even knowing that you are really in control of the history, take, history taking. And well, um, if we teach the residents, there's one big problem that we noticed that a lot of people uh, perform pattern recognition. So they see a CT scan, and what you see is, for instance, a, a dehiscent superior canal. The patient says, I'm dizzy. So people say, that must be superior canal dehiscence, for instance. And a lot of people with superior canal dehiscence are referred to tertiary referral clinics with the question whether there is any superior canal dehiscence syndrome. But the key point is that you perform a very thorough examination. And if you then look at all these patients, for instance, with superior canal dehiscence, most of them, they don't have the syndrome. They just have a dehiscent canal. And also with this patient, when you really uh, paid good attention to his history, he actually suffered from just a unilateral loss. So there are a lot of misconceptions, mainly in history taking, that are still taking place all over the world. And uh, the David Newman Toker, he did some research with his team, and he asked a lot of uh, frontline providers, that's in the States, the emergency department, and they gave him questions with yes or no. And they were all about vestibular problems. And if you would think about a normal distribution, if they just gambled, you would have a normal distribution with a performance around 50%. But in this research, they noticed that actually people really made more mistakes than you would have uh, thought by just gambling. And it was because of misconceptions. And a lot of those misconceptions are even more illustrated and more research. For instance, they looked at the emergency department, and in 81% of the cases they reviewed, they looked at the records, and there was some nystagmus written down in the, in the files that were actually not consistent with the diagnosis that was eventually made. And they did some calculations. They said, well, if it's something like this, this could result in a lot of potential deaths a year. And those misconceptions are at, s at all the levels. For instance, with history taking, one of the m biggest misconceptions is that people traditionally look at the type of vertigo. But the type of vertigo, we always said, OK, if it's vertigo, then it must be peripheral. But if it's lightheadedness, it cannot be f coming from the vestibular system. But patients are actually very unreliable when it comes to describing what they feel. They describe what they feel, but it's not really consistent with what could happen with the vestibular system. So we should focus more on occurrence of the problems and on triggers. I'll come to that later. Another misconception is in the diagnosis, uh, for instance, the physical examination, because less than 50% of the patients in acute vestibular syndrome, they show classic neurological signs. So you could miss them if you just do this kind of test, you know? And with the, in our country at least, a lot of people perform CT scans just to rule out bleedings or something like that in acute vestibular problems, but it seems that the sensitivity of a CT scan is only around 16% to, to detect problems in the posterior fossa. So, well, let's go back to the history taking. We have to focus not really on type, but more on occurrence and triggers. And if you focus on that, you can come to th three uh, syndromes that we all know, but actually it's plus one. Because the three that we know are, of course, acute, episodic, and chronic. And if you look at them, you don't have to uh, write them all down. They're also in your files. But you have occurrence, acute, episodic, and chronic. And then you can distinguish with the triggers. And the triggers are really important if you ask for them. Because if you just ask a patient, what's the trigger? Often they say, there is no trigger. 
But during history, they will tell you that they're avoiding some things, or that they, because some things make it worse, and that's actually also a trigger. So then you, I often ask the patients just in different ways for triggers. First I ask, is there any trigger? And then they say no. Then I ask, well, is there anything that you avoid? Uh, yes, this and this. Or can you make it worse by doing something? And mainly the people with the visually induced vertigo, they often um, find it very hard to tell you that visually patterns are actually a trigger, unless you specifically ask for it. But to make it more complex, you have those three syndromes, but actually you have a fourth one that Herman already explained. Because you have the combination of episodic and acute, for instance attacks, combined with complaints of hypofunction. And if you look at an attack, it's like a bird is coming there and it's flying right into the engine of the airplane. So you have an acute asymmetry, just like what happens during the attack. And you know, mayday, mayday, you try to land. But you're also at that point, an airplane that's just uh, flying on one engine. So it's not only losing it, but also flying on one engine. And in Meyer's disease, you can, for instance, see during an attack, an astagmus, <coughs> very brisk. But if you look at the pattern that people often have, is that at first, this is the function, and this is in time. First, they have an attack, so you lose some function. And then they have another attack, and another attack. But eventually, the function don't, does not recover anymore to where it started. So at that point, patients are actually suffering from attacks and hypofunction at the same time. And eventually, sometimes only on a hypofunction, just as Herman explained about uh, people with Meniere's disease. When the attacks disappear, they often still have problems. But if you start history taking with a patient, for instance, in this phase, which has attacks and hypofunction, people will just say that they're dizzy, and they're going to tell you the whole story, and it's very hard to separate the attacks from the hypofunction. And to make it even more complex, often it's all modulated by also panic. So that's why we thought about maybe we can make a step-by-step -step plan to just take all the symptoms, set them apart, and to divide, for instance, the attacks with the hypofunction. So, well, you all know that it takes time, and that's why a lot of colleagues, and probably also your colleagues, don't really like to see vestibular patients, because it takes more time than for ENT, for instance, uh, you know, somebody with an ear problem, or EUX, or that kind of stuff. So, step one. People first tell a little bit that they're dizzy, and then if you notice that there are any attacks, you can say, okay, let's first start with describing an average attack. Because then the patients know that you're really focusing on the attack before focusing on their whole problem. And if you have an attack, and I'll focus on that first, you say, okay, you have an attack, then you can describe the attack. And uh, yeah, an uh, acronym to describe the dizziness of the attack is so stoned, invented by colleagues of us in Belgium. And you see the O and the T, they are blue, and that means that also during description of that attack, focus on the occurrence and the triggers more than on the type. And if you look at this so stoned, it's just since when did it happen? Then the occurrence, how often does it happen? Then the symptoms, that's a little bit the type, lightheadedness, dizzy, dizziness, vertigo, instability, that kind of stuff. And then the triggers. And sometimes the trigger can, of course, be uh, very clear. I need some sound, probably. Okay, sound off. This is one of the people we can get referred with the touch your referral center. You see, th this was a real clear trigger. He just stood up, and this happened for, I will not bother you because it takes two minutes before he stops. But this is a clear trigger. But next to the triggers, of course, to rule out with Meniere's disease, or to see whether it's migraines, you can ask for otological symptoms, neurological symptoms, evolution and duration. And if you just always follow the steps, and especially when you're in a setting with uh, residents that you have to teach, if you say, okay, just follow that acronym, then you know that they will ask most of the questions that you want to know. But once you have described the attack, also look in the acute phase for the, yeah, the 
the United States, they like always uh, fancy uh, abbreviations, so the deadly Ds, uh, dysartria, diplopia, dysphagia, dysphonia, dysmetria, dysesthesia. And uh, with headache, be careful with the three S's, sudden, severe, sustained. So if a patient in the acute phase has that, of course, look more thoroughly. But after that, you know that you have the attack. And then you can try to look whether there are any complaints of hypofunction. And Herman already told that hypofunction is not only instability, because it has a lot of connections with the autonomic uh, nervous system and, and more systems. So you can look very specifically, is chronic involved? So chronic complaints of hypofunction. And then you say, okay, during the attacks, we have described it, but do you also have complaints in between attacks? Or sometimes when the attacks subsided, do you have complaints now that are still there? And uh, an easy acronym, do not forget all the things uh, to remember is the disco head. Yeah, you don't have to remember it, it's more that you know that there are more things involved than only instability. And if you look at this disco head, that's uh, as well for unilateral complaints as for bilateral complaints. But in bilateral complaints, of course, you have more um, prominent uh, features than in unilateral complaints. For instance, in darkness, that's mainly for bilateral people, of course, bilateral patients, because you try to compensate with your visual system, and in darkness, if you have no vestibular function, your, your visual system is also less likely to compensate very well, so people often have more complaints in darkness. Then the imbalance. That's, of course, very logical, because balance is one of the main features that has to be uh, regulated by the vestibular system. And then the supermarket effect. And or op sensibility, sensitivity to optokinetic stimuli. That's, um, for instance, people often say due to, for instance, but the visual uh, vestibular mismatch, but it can also be due to psychogenic factors or anything else, or hypofunction, but people find it very hard to sometimes walk through the aisle of a supermarket because they have a lot of patterns that they're walking through and it makes them dizzy. And this is a patient explaining what she feels when she has uh, problems with the, the supermarket. Ik ben bekend met aanvallen, hè. meerdere malen een aanval van duizeligheid gehad. Ja. Nu hebt u sinds een twee maanden eigenlijk geen aanval meer gehad. Nee. Maar u hebt wel resterende klachten. Kunt u die misschien eens uitleggen? Ik heb heel veel last van uh, verschillende motiefjes naast elkaar. Dus bijvoorbeeld het uh, motief van de straat, dat de tegels van de straat in een bepaald patroon liggen ten opzichte van de stoep en de muren. Hè, van huizen waar je langs loopt, daar word ik helemaal busy van. Uh, in de supermarkt heb ik veel last van, uh, ja, gewoon van de kleuren, de, de, de patronen, de drukte, de diepte ook. Ja, dus als ik daar loop, dan heb ik altijd een beetje het gevoel dat het een beetje op me afkomt. En, uh, uh, ja. Als je in de trein auto, zit? Ja, met de, in de trein inderdaad heb ik last van het langschietende beeld. In de auto ook overigens. Heb ik ook wel moeite met inschatten van de snelheid bijvoorbeeld. Van, uh, van de verkeer om me heen. Of uh, van de auto's die langs reizen, uh, rijden. Met, de, met name op de snelweg vind ik dat best wel... En hoe is het met licht? Met licht, ja ook. Dus flitsend licht, dat is best wel... Uh, als je in, bijvoorbeeld in een laan rijdt waar bomen zitten... Uh, dus waar het licht uh, invalt, met flits als het ware, dat, vind ik, dat is niet fijn. So and often this supermarket effect of visually induced vertigo, patients will not report that always by themselves. So if you ask for a trigger, also ask for, do you get dizzy, for instance, in supermarkets? Or uh, I'm always when I'm talking with patients, I know I'm a little bit... Uh, busy guy, so I make many gestures, and I already see the patients looking like this, you know, please do not move too much. And, and if people are doing that already, you know, okay, probably some visually induced vertigo can be a problem of the whole picture. So, of course, because patients are busy all the time with keeping their balance, for instance, they sometimes also say, uh, stop talking when walking, you, uh, they are also not always that well in keeping uh, up with all the conversations, so concentration, memory, that kind of stuff can also be affected. And of course, as Herman already showed you, the reduced dynamic visual acuity, that can lead to oscillopsia. So ask for that. And if you ask, do you uh, walk, uh, when you walk, do you not recognize faces? Or when you're on a bumpy road, is it difficult to read signs? People often say yes, 
then I would suggest to ask, okay, give an, ex give an example, because often the example is not really an example of dynamic visual acuity. <laughs> so always check it when patients say yes. Uh, and of course, why we're we here for the most of the time, the fast head movements. A lot of patients will say, if you ask for it, that they have problems with fast head movements. For instance, when driving on the bike, looking at the side, or when they want to cross the road, looking from left to right, for instance. And then you can, as we know, perform the head impulse test. And what you see is that with each head movement, actually, the eyes will lag behind. And that means that patients feel that when they're walking, that, that they try to avoid their head movements because they get dizzy. If we normally want to turn to the left, first we, we turn our head a little bit and then our body will follow. But those patients, as Herman already explained, will be more like a robot. We call it bottom-up. They walk a little bit like this, very careful. And sometimes if, anx if anxiety is also playing a role, it gets even worse. Komt u maar. Oké, okay, draait u zich maar eens om. You see how careful she's. Their head is fixed onto the en wat rest of the body. Het hoofd bewegen. Dat ik uh, mijn hoofd zo zoveel mogelijk altijd stil hou. Waarom? Omdat ik dan toch iets uh, beter kan concentreren op het lopen. Okay. Achter mijn rollator of door het huis en waar ik al vast hou. Okay. So you see here, sometimes when you ask patients to, to come in, in your consultation room, they're already walking like that. You can think, okay, that's already a sign that something must be wrong. Um, next to it, of course, the autonomic functions ask for that. And a lot of patients, especially in bilateral problems, and it's more prominent than you think, bilateral vestibulopathy um, is much more often um, found in a population than you would expect. If you look for it, you will find it. But a lot of those patients will say that they're very tired because they're continuously compensating for the deficit. Because, very important, the other side does not take over. So, this is what we have described when you have attacks and hyperfunction. If people are just chronically in balance or out of balance, then you can just use the two acronyms at the same time. But if you ask for it specifically, you will not miss anything. So if you have separated attacks from chronic and from chronic complaints after attacks, you often have the feeling that there is a discrepancy between the subjective complaints that they'll tell you and the objective findings that you will find in history taking or during your physical examination or ENG. So, the last step that nobody should forget in cases that are a little bit more difficult, screen whether there's any problem with psychology. It's because psychological factors and vestibular disorders, they often go hand in hand. If you look at a lot of research, you see that psychi psychiatric and psychological problems are much more prominent in the vestibular population. Even we know some areas, for instance, in the hippocampus where they even come together. So, for instance, this is a patient, if you look at her, she's turning around and she's doing that the whole day. And that's, of course, all of you will say, that's not normal behavior, whatever you have. I think we can agree on that. Huh? But if you measure her, you will see that she has a deficit. And her history was actually part of hypofunction, so she had a deficit, but also with psychological complaints making it much more worse. So that's why it's always important to screen for a third step for psychological complaints and why is it that the subjective complaints do or do not match the objective problems. And you can use, for instance, the hospital anxiety and depression scale, that's a questionnaire, and the dizziness handicap inventory, and then eventually you can think about making a diagnosis. One of the newer diagnoses now being made in, vestibular in the vestibular disorders are the PPPD, that's the persistent postural and perceptual dizziness. That's actually what used to be the chronic subjective dizziness or the phobic postural vertigo and even the visually induced vertigo is also now part of the PPPD. And that's when the anxiety is a big part. 
And it's not really necessary that PPPD is the sole diagnosis. It's often a second diagnosis made next to a somatic diagnosis. And this is a patient with PPPD. Nu, nu gaat er iets helemaal rond in mijn hoofd. Uh -huh. Waardoor ik uh, geen houvast meer heb. Ik voel mijn voeten wel, maar ik heb het idee dat ik naar achter val. Of, uh, dus dan moet ik eerst twee benen staan. Wachten tot die uitgetold is. En dan zeg ik tegen mezelf, ga naar links. Nou, kunt u eens draaien naar links? Ja, ja, ja. ja. Je ziet als op bottom-up. Moet ik nu hier zitten? Ja, als het kan. Of blijf maar eventjes staan daarvoor. Ja, prima. Oké, okay, this is only on history already that, that you can suspect that anxiety is a problem. Of her whole problem. And then if you look at how she's walking, it's actually a confirmation that it's also anxiety that makes things worse. Often with PPPD, people have had a vestibular problem. For example, BPPV or um, an neuritis, and after that they have complaints that do not match with all your results. And often that's because of the anxiety. So as the last step, screen for psychological problems. So, well, to almost end up just some pitfalls during history taking, although you structureize your history taking, sometimes there are still some pitfalls. For instance, three patients with the same story, Often they come in and say, I was dizzy for a week. And then you find the vestibular hypofunction on the right, with, for instance, your head impulse test. And the, what's the first diagnosis you think of? Now, most people will say, ah, well, probably that's an neuritis. But that's why you should really focus on the occurrence and the triggers. Because most patients, they really think that they were dizzy for a week. But if you ask, were you really dizzy for a week? Then most of them will say, well, it was three days, very dizzy. After that, I it took a while to recover. Or some people say, I was dizzy for five hours, but really unstable for a week. And others will say, well, actually, I was not dizzy all the time, but only when I moved my head. And then you have much more diagnosis you can think of. So history taking is really important, because if you find, for instance, a hypofunction, you must really be sure that it fits the diagnosis fits the complaints of the patient, otherwise you might be treating them for the wrong thing. Uh, so, ask for exact duration and triggers. And people are sometimes so sick that if they do not report any hearing loss, tinnitus, migraines or headaches, that actually they don't always know that they have it, because they are so dizzy, they are only focusing on the dizziness. And of course for vestibular migraine, you don't need the headaches to be at the same time as the attacks. So uh, not having migraine headaches during a vestibular migraine attack does not rule out vestibular migraine. And of course, as Herman already told us, vertigo is not always present. Actually, it does not have to be present. It can be instability, um, susceptible visual stimuli, that kind of stuff. So if you look at how you could structureize it, I don't say you have to do it like that, but if you just follow the steps, then you could say, okay, first focus on the attacks, because the patient has been having attacks for two years. And then the average attacks includes, for instance, a sudden sensation of vertigo, hearing loss on the left, so you ask for the otological symptoms. Next to it, you ask for the neurological symptoms and neurological signs. And then you ask for duration. And the nice thing is that if you ask for an average attack to describe it, it saves you time, and often, they will tell you also that maybe not always hearing is involved, but in most of the cases it is. And then you say just a duration, five minutes, two to hours, with a frequency of two to five times each month. So that's first describing the attack. Then you say, okay, do you have any problems in between attacks? Or maybe now your attacks have subsided. And then you can screen, for instance, with the disco head. I don't say that you need to use that, but it's to show what all kind of complaints people have. And then you just ask for that. And if you see that there is, for instance, imbalance um, or an insta instability with fast head movements, you could suspect a hypofunction. So for instance, you, this is the diagnosis that you can think of, but you have to do more thorough investigation, of course, for instance, with the head impulse test. OK, so conclusions. As Herman already said with the linear sensations,
of the utriculus and seculus, maybe we also have to abandon um, more the classical approach also with history taking, not only looking at the physiology of the system, and we have to focus more on occurrence and triggers. And if you follow the steps and separate attacks from the hyperfunction, sometimes it's much more easy to get to the right diagnosis. And then you come up to the four syndromes. And if you recognize the pitfalls, for instance, that you don't need to have vertigo, and that that's what I mean, the spinning sensation, or that the other side does not take over, and there is psychological comorbidity, then I think it's much more easy to come to a right diagnosis.